it's the 20th. Uh, it's a 23 seminar, so we chose how the series has taken ground over, over time and uh, uh, it was very successful. Uh, we have an important topic uh, is uh, uh, about uh, the new European initiatives of creating European university alliances and particularly uh, the relationship with, between alliances and the trends we observe on uh, stratification of higher education institutions. Uh, the paper will be presented by Agatha Lambrex, who is postdoctoral researcher at the uh, Università della Svizzera Italiana in Lugano. And we have a distinguished speak, uh, discussant, uh, Thomas Heinz, uh, professor at the University of Wuppertal and one of the specialists of higher education analysis uh, uh, in, in Europe. As usual, uh, the presentation will last uh, 35 minutes. Uh, then I will give the word to Thomas for uh, um, a discussion, and then we will open for questions and answer by, by the audience. Uh, you can ask questions uh, in the chat, uh, or you can raise your hands. Uh, when you talk, uh, uh, please uh, um, open your camera so we get at least a, a, a small level of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interaction. And as usual, Please mute your micro when uh, you are not talking uh, so that we, uh, we can uh, uh, listen well to the presentation. Uh, all this said, uh, I give the word to Agatha for uh, her presentation of the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benedetta. Okay, let me make sure you can see my screen. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll begin uh, with a, a short introduction. Um, yeah, institutional horizontal diversity and vertical characterization um, have been among the most dominant tendencies shaping the higher education um, field uh, sector in the last few decades, uh, featuring heavily in both policy and research uh, around the world. Uh, in Europe, the scholarly debates have been in the past somewhat limited to the context of national systems or cross-country comparisons, uh, addressing the impact of state and market forces, as well as the massification of the sector, and the impact of institutional strategies on the horizontal diversity uh, of the higher education sector. Um, we have a big, rich body of literature now um, focusing on the influence and interest in excellence initiatives, quality assessments, and national league tables and performance-based funding. And we've also seen many papers on the pursuit of the label of world-class university uh, and international comparisons and rankings creating vertical status hierarchies uh, on the one hand and leading to a greater isomorphism towards the favorite model of the research university uh, and so diminish um, horizontal diversity uh, on the other hand. The impact of the European level policies, um, in particular the Bologna process uh, on convergence or divergence of the system uh, at both the national and pan-European level have also received some attention already. But the impact of European um, level, the newer European level policies um, perhaps unsurprisingly, considering uh, the timeline, um, has not yet received uh, as much attention. And I'm speaking here uh, about the flagship initiatives for the implementation of the European strategy for universities, uh, the initiatives which aim to propel the global competitiveness and attractiveness of European education area in synergy with the European research area. Um, but we don't know the effect on the European higher education system and uh, its institutions. Uh, so if you bear with me for another 30 minutes or so, uh, I will share with you our ongoing work uh, and an assessment of the initiative in light of the long-standing debates about horizontal diversity and um, in particular the vertical differentiation. Um, the goal of, uh, of our research in this paper is to examine the mechanisms which influence the participation of higher education institutions in the European Universities Initiative, and specifically, to what extent does participation in the initiative reflect 
the global level stratification hierarchy as cast by rankings. How does the status hierarchy interact with national specificities and the goal of achieving a European wide coverage? And which processes explain the formation of alliances? Uh, so first, a very brief introduction to the European Universities Initiative itself, although I trust most of you probably are somewhat familiar with it um, already. And the initiative aims to enable creation of a um, new organizational form, we can say, of a long-term sustainable strategic transnational, currently regional alliances of higher education institutions, which are to cooperate in education, research, and innovation. The alliances are called European Universities, uh, and they have to consist of at least three institutions based in different countries. And there are two types of member institutions, full members, and those can be higher education institutions only. Uh, until now, they would have to be based in Erasmus Plus or associate countries. Uh, and then there are associate members. Uh, those can be local governments, other institutions uh, outside Europe, NGOs, private companies, etc. Um, but also uh, here we have a special case, the UK and Swiss institutions uh, cannot participate, cannot be funded through Erasmus Plus. Um, so they are officially associate members, but uh, appear to be considered by the alliances as full members. So we, in, we include them in our um, analysis. Um, very briefly, where are we now? And there were two pilot phases uh, with 160 applications. Uh, 41 alliances were created with a budget of 287 million euros in total. Um, that included 5 million from Erasmus Plus funds and up to 2 million from Horizon 2020 for a period of three years um, per alliance, uh, irrespective of the size. Uh, late this summer, a uh, first long term support, which received 52 proposals from around 350 institutions. Um, we, we received the um, decisions on, on who gets the funding. Uh, 16 out of 17 of the first pilot phase alliances, as we call it first phase, first wave, uh, received, uh, will be receiving this funding, uh, all now with additional partners, and four new alliances were established. Uh, the budget for this uh, is 272 million euros for a period of four years. Uh, with two pots of funding, a bigger overall pot for continuing alliances and a smaller for newer ones. Uh, of note here is that some institutions receive significant financial support from the national governments to partake in the initiative. Uh, and I can refer you here to a recent report on performance-based funding that has a brilliant chapter with an overview uh, of this uh, uh, funding in uh, European uh, universities uh, published by colleagues at CHEPS at the University of Twente um, a few days ago. Um, so currently we have 44 European universities, 44 alliances with more than 340 higher education institutions in 33 countries. Um, by mid-2024, there will be some 60 alliances, uh, which should uh, include around 500 higher education institutions. In the interest of clarity, let's talk about uh, definitions and theories underpinning our study very briefly. Um, over the years, the structuring of uh, the field has been described in various ways, but we use uh, currently widely used concepts uh, which explain the existing patterns as two directional. Um, we refer to horizontal diversity as indicating a variety of um, higher education institutions by type or profile. And we use the concept of vertical differentiation to indicate the process of distinguishing institution by status. And the concepts um, about organization status have been present in the higher education field for some time, of course, um, but these have been augmented by national and international developments. Uh, and I will briefly summarize some of these in a moment. But what all of them, the international rankings, excellence initiatives, accreditations, ratings, and awards all have in common, is that they attempt to measure, reward, and promote the institutional performance in terms of excellence of quality and primarily that of research, uh, with some of these purposely and others inadvertently contributing to status competition and a more or less formalized sector hierarchization. 
Uh, so why consider status? Uh, it's important for higher education institutions. It affords the higher status uh, institutions more legitimacy and so uh, resource stability. It allows them to take more risks and uh, to influence the rules governing future competitions for more status uh, and resources. Uh, now, a little about the context. Uh, no, the, historically, the sector in Europe has been characterized by diversity of national systems and heterogeneity of uh, institutions uh, and programs within the system. And this could be attributed to the differences in political, cultural, and academic traditions uh, across the continent. But over the last three to four decades, we've witnessed significant moves towards a more integrated and coherent system at this uh, supranational uh, regional level as part of the European higher education uh, area and more uh, European research area, and then more recently, the European education area. Uh, it's the Bologna process and the European Union framework programs uh, that have been to date the most important political instruments driving the convergence of degree structures, uh, which in turn facilitate student and staff mobility and stimulating cross-country and cross-disciplinary collaborations between European institutions. Um, the ultimate aim of Bologna implied that quality differences between higher education institutions should be kept in bounds, um, but the framework programs together with the establishment of a European research area triggered intra-institutional competition and persistently awarding funding predominantly to the already research active research rich higher education institutions um, which in turn increased their research outputs and contributed to the international standing. And this led to increased stratification of the sector in Europe, uh, as well as growing regional inequalities with the status of institutions in the wealthier regions uh, increasing while the poorer regions are left with the weaker institutions. And particularly not, not, noteworthy here is the repeated underperformance of the so-called EU 13 countries, so those which joined the European Union after 2004 um, in the framework programs competitions. Uh, the same policies, Bologna and, and framework programs can be said uh, to also serve as uh, homogenizing pressures, leading to decrease in the horizontal diversity across the system as um, Bologna processes led to a weakened division uh, of work between different types of institutions and the framework programs as an incentive instrument triggered uh, mimetic isomorphism in the non-university sector or the non-research universities as seeking to emulate the research paradigm of universities to improve their access to uh, competitive external funding. Um, now the policy evolution at the European level has been um, concurrent with other global and national level developments, uh, which also influence each other. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't spend uh, too much uh, discussing the national developments, except mentioning just that the introduction of the way meant to strengthen research at the selected institutions and enhance the global appeal, creating top segment of world-class universities within the national sectors and driving the performance in the global rankings. And about those now. Uh, the major development pushing forward the uh, um, widely visible now vertical stratification, um, but also decreasing the horizontal diversity of European higher education institutions has been the introduction of the now pervasive and quite powerful international rankings, uh, which attempt to measure and position institutions according to a set of primary research excellence and research-based teaching criteria. Now, obviously, issues of validity and reliability and weighting of indicators uh, and rank ordering of institutions, um, which uh, overemphasize the often small and insignificant differences between institutions um, that are uh, debated by both researchers uh, and policymakers. Uh, with some arguing that rankings are actually damaging to individual institutions and the system as a whole. Uh, and in fact, driving the production of reputation and status rather than reflecting it. Uh, yet today it's maybe not accepted, but widely acknowledged that the higher education systems around the world are increasingly stratified according to status hierarchies, 
uh, contrived by rankings, uh, which central universities, so the PhD awarding research active institutions. Um, although the, the debate on disadvantages versus advantages of such stratification and whether in light of those, the European higher education should become more stratified and in that way, similar to the US um, are far from over. Um, same slide, sorry. Uh, an important aspect uh, of the process of strat stratification uh, that must be mentioned here is that markets tend to split up into segments, the status segments. Uh, as social relationships, including those between organizations, tend to be uh, related to status. Um, the literature suggests that uh, status segments reduce the numbers of direct competitors, uh, which in higher education can be relevant for selection of scientific collaborators. Thank you. I'm citing your work here. Uh, or as we will see here, the whole institution uh, allies or partners with higher education institutions within the same status strata joining together. In the simplest terms, in our study, we respond using empirical evidence to some previous work. Um, this has been raised by a couple of researchers, but also by different stakeholders uh, of the European Universities Initiative. Um, and it, excellence versus inclusivity has been one of the key debates uh, in relation to the initiative so far. Um, Andrew Gunn in 2020 envisaged two potential scenarios for the initiative, an inclusive one with a broad range of institutions working with compatible partners or an exclusive elite one. And this leads us to a first research question as introduced earlier. Based on the assumption that the competition in higher education is essentially status related and that stratification will interact with the selection mechanism, uh, given the flagship nature of um, the European Universities Initiative and one of its primary objectives um, as um, being to raise the global competitiveness of European higher education. So we expected that a high proportion of institutions participating in the initiative will come from the um, upper echelons of the global rankings. Um, now, status and similarity, since status are just one possible explanation of participation in the initiative and the possible mechanism behind the formation of individual alliances. We are borrowing perspective from sociology and management literature, which identify uh, three core observable theoretical mechanisms for formation of ties between actors here, uh, higher education institutions that comprise the analysis. So uh, we've got complementary similarities and pre-existing network ties. And uh, most commonly cited uh, in literature mechanism is the tendency for alliance to be formed by organizations that share or are similar in terms of some attributes. Of course, uh, already, already mentioned status here. Um, but those can also include features such as size, age, geography, or social environments. Second mechanism uh, identified in the literature is that of complementaries. Um, to achieve um, greater um, value and to gain advantage, uh, organizations must find partners which are somehow different from their own. In the European Universities Initiative, and there is a top-down requirement for alliances to include institutions from different countries in different regions. And for us, very interesting is also how do the geographical patterns relate to the institutional status. Um, much research also suggests that organizations are more likely to form alliances with actors with whom they already have ties, organizations they trust, uh, with whom they share a history of exchange of information. A recently published study by Anthony Charette and Maya Chancelli from University of Oxford, um, based on multiple case study of three uh, European uh, universities, free alliances, found that uh, pre-existing ties were reported as very important uh, during the formation of alliances, of those free alliances, at least in the first phase uh, of the pilot the study was based. On that. Uh, so in our study, we look at the full sample using other sources of data in search of supporting or non-supporting evidence of this mechanism. Um, so according to our second and third questions are, how does the status hierarchy interact with national specificities, specificities 
and the goal of achieving a wide European coverage, and which processes explain the formation of alliances. Uh, the method, uh, we examined status markers. We, we used uh, the academic ranking of world universities uh, for both participating and non-participating uh, institutions. But I mean, participating or not participating in the European Universities Initiative. Uh, and we look at the alliance composition by status. We then calculated the correlation between the number of participation in the initiative with the relative system size in different European countries. Uh, for this, we used uh, the Eurostat data, and we examined the country patterns and assess how the geographical patterns relate to uh, institutional status. And finally, we tested whether alliances have been preferentially formed between institutions collaborating in the past in framework programs or exchanging students through Erasmus+. Uh, we examined the participation in other institutional partnerships or networks uh, which precede the European Universities Initiative. Uh, and finally, we conducted a directed content analysis of some public tests. There are um, um, fact sheets on European universities published um, by the European Commission. Uh, and we looked at the alliances uh, on websites. Um, caveat here, we did not look at uh, the four new alliances uh, web pages yet, as, as they don't uh, seem to uh, include the, the relevant information. And for two, we were not able to find any relevant details um, on the on the web pages or in the fact sheets. So, so the, the full sample of analyzed text relates to 38 alliances. So before we turn to our key findings addressing the, the pre-research uh, questions, uh, a little kind of framing information here, uh, including the sample. So we uh, mostly extracted data from the European Tertiary Education Register, ETER. Uh, we've included here the 33 countries currently participating in the initiative, including UK and Switzerland. Uh, and our data set then includes 2,800 uh, institutions uh, with relevant information. Uh, we are researching the 44 currently existing alliances, well, they will be currently existing as of November, um, which consists uh, close to, of close to 350 institutions. Uh, we do intend to maybe expand or um, rather um, further distinguish in our data between the say, original members and the new members who uh, are joining the existing alliances or the members of the four new alliances, uh, which will be uh, funded from November. We will, of course, uh, share this as, as soon as, as possible. Uh, but for now, we can say that member institutions uh, are, statistically speaking, uh, larger. Uh, they have more resources in terms of academic personnel. They engage in both research and education activities, in particular at master's level. Uh, they're likely to have uh, engaged in teaching and research in STEM uh, and have a stronger international profile. Uh, so they have both a higher share of internationally mobile degree students, but also receive substantially more students through Erasmus Plus than the uh, institutions which are not part of the alliances. And we find it very important to, to share here that uh, the higher education institutions already participating um, cover at least 54% of the share of doctoral students in the EU. So at the moment, it's uh, about 10% of higher education institutions, let's say, um, but they cover more than half of uh, doctoral uh, researchers, and they account for a third of uh, ISCAT 6 and 7 levels, that is bachelor's and master's students uh, in Europe. And turning now to status, and the general picture emerging from uh, the analysis is that the European University uh, universities initiative member institutions constitute a core of research intensive institutions in Europe. Um, only a little over 53% of um, the in involved institutions are ranked in the top 1000 um, by the Shanghai ranking. But our analysis suggests that a quarter of those top ranked institutions, so those which are 
in the first 100, top 100 in the world, and about two thirds of those in the upper bracket, so one to 500, already participate in the initiative. Um, we note, however, that the new participants, the ones joining from November this year, um, include only two institutions ranked in the top 100, they both Swiss, uh, and they include a relatively high proportion of non-ranked institutions. So 61% of all non uh, all new participations are from non-ranked, so the 1,000 plus institutions. Uh, it suggests to us that as the pool of the top ranked institutions eligible and not yet participating in the initiative becomes smaller, uh, the profile of new members diversifies. Uh, now, looking at the composition of alliances, um, what the figure on the slide indicates is that whilst around half of the alliances have indeed been formed by institutions within the same or neighboring prestige strata um, or status strata, uh, this has been more prevalent among the institutions at the bottom segment of the ranking. So, seven alliances are formed uh, entirely of non ranked institutions, and eight are a mix of institutions rank between 500 and 1,000 and non-rank institutions, but only two of the 42 alliances don't include any non-ranked institutions, and a total of 22 includes um, a mix of institutions in terms of status. Uh, of the 10 alliances, which are at the top here, uh, which includes the top-ranked European institutions, only three don't include any non-ranked institutions. Uh, we have not noticed any specific patterns in, in relation to the enlargement uh, yet when considering status alone. So in summary, uh, we suggest that it can be observed already that alliances formation in the framework of the uh, initiative activated the mechanism of characterization, uh, leading to a creation of a network of alike institutions uh, in terms of uh, status. Uh, establishing a, a prestige hierarchy, although not a new one. So uh, we argue that the global level stratification hierarchy as caused by rankings influences both the participation of individual institutions and uh, although to a more limited extent, the formational structure of the alliances within um, the initiative. And now I turn to geographical patterns. Uh, here we can see the number of participations by country. Uh, we've considered based on early feedback from Thomas, our discussion today actually to include a figure illustrating the geographical location for all member institutions, which uh, we can do, but we would like some feedback from the audience today as well um, of whether you think it, it will be readable with almost 350 institutions uh, involved now, or maybe we should click by, by region. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure it would be useful to, to hear what you think. Uh, but we'll note that a sizable proportion, around 40% of institutions come from only four countries, Germany, France, Spain, and Italy, uh, with 19 of the alliances coordinated by an institution in Germany or uh, France. And these figures are um, maybe less striking if we consider the relative higher education system size of these countries. So if we look at the participation, uh, within the countries with a large sector size. So this is the sector size. Um, we find that France, Germany, Poland, Spain, Italy, and Netherlands, um, they are larger in size. Uh, the participation is larger in size than non-participation. Um, UK is an interesting case, obviously a, a relatively large system. Um, but it's a special case. So they don't, they cannot participate in the initiative on the same basis as other states. We think that the most useful way of looking at the geographical patterns is in terms of balance um, uh, participation by the, um, the so-called EU15, so the old EU member states, uh, which were members before 2004, um, and uh, although we exclude the UK from this group here, um, and then the so-called EU13 member states which joined after 2004 
In literature, it's sometimes including uh, Switzerland, but we include UK, Swiss, um, not Switzerland, I apologize, Serbia. Um, but we include the UK, Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, Turkey, and Serbia as non-EU countries. 69% um, of institutions in the alliances come from the EU 15 states, 23% come from the EU 13, and the remaining 8% uh, come from the non-EU uh, states. Um, we note that there has been a further positive change in the balance between participation of these groups in, um, of countries in 2022, uh, with 40% of the new members now coming uh, from either EU 13 states, 26%, so or from the non-EU countries, it's 14% of new members come from that. And all alliances now include an EU 13 country, which we include Serbia as a special case, uh, although in only 19 of them, the proportion of the EU 13 countries exceeds uh, one quarter. So it seems that the rules of the games have succeeded in generating a reasonably good geographical spread. Um, as institutions can participate only once in a single alliance, and the pool of prestigious institutions is limited, generating incentives to, to broaden the scope uh, geographically. Uh, interestingly, although perhaps not surprisingly, is the relationship uh, between the location and status position. Um, so here is the, is the summary that uh, I've already mentioned, um, but it's interesting to consider that 40% of the EU 15 participations include non-ranked positions, 72% of the EU 13, uh, are from non-ranked participants, and 25 of the non-EU members are non-ranked institutions. The patterns are changing a little bit with the um, enlargement of the um, initiative. From the new participations, uh, a larger proportion of the new members are non-ranked. Um, there are some increases in the non-EU and, and EU 13 as well. Uh, so as mentioned before, um, the 76% uh, of the top ranked uh, institutions are already uh, in. So um, the pool of highly ranked institution is, is diminishing now. Um, we look more, looked more closely at the states with the highest number of institutions included in the rankings. Um, we looked uh, at France, uh, where we find that 69% of institutions are now members uh, in, uh, of the initiative, and it includes all of the top ranked universities. In Germany and Spain, the figures are a bit lower with 51% of institutions ranked uh, in Shanghai rankings participating in the initiative. And in Italy, it's 46. <clears throat> But for these three countries, for Germany, Spain, and Italy, um, the number the, or the share of um, highly ranked uh, or ranked institutions in the initiative has increased by 5% uh, with the enlargement uh, in 2022. Uh, we also looked at Poland, uh, another country with a large system size, although with less visibility uh, in the upper brackets of the rankings. Still 60% of the ranked institutions in Poland already participate <clears throat> in the alliances, um, but only a tiny proportion of its non-ranked institutions, 5%, uh, are part of the initiative. Uh, and I've also included um, uh, UK here, although its position is, of course, somewhat different. Um, maybe it's unsurprising that uh, non-ranked institutions do not feature at all um, in the alliances. Uh, from uh, including UK partners. Um, in summary then, uh, we showed uh, empirically that some of the distinctive policy design measures, uh, so the requirement for broad geographical coverage and the generically framed um, rules for participation, namely that uh, you can only participate in one alliance, uh, generate opportunities for participation for the um, less prestigious, not as uh, not only top ranked institutions um, uh, in the global rankings. 
Uh, the initiative appears to be geographically balanced with participation roughly proportional to the number of institutions in the different parts of Europe, uh, which can be contrasted with the um, uneven participation and budget distribution in Horizon 2020, which uh, remains very visibly biased against the EU 13 countries um, based in the Eastern and Southern Europe, uh, which uh, so the countries that entered EU after 2004. Uh, next, we looked into the additional data which helps us understand the participation and, in particular, the formation of alliances. Uh, we found that many of the alliances have pre-existing network types in terms of collaborations in Horizon 2020. Uh, the intensity uh, or the intensity of student exchanges uh, within Erasmus+. Plus. We find that institutions in uh, UNA Universitas uh, and Enhance have the highest intensity of cooperation within um, uh, their respective alliances in both Horizon and Erasmus uh, programs. The other alliances, other European universities, such as Eurotech and um, New Neurotech, uh, which focus on engineering uh, and brain research, uh, they have substantially more network ties in Horizon research than in uh, Erasmus. Uh, and then alliances focused on social sciences, such as Engage EU, Civica, have more network ties in Erasmus uh, than in Horizons. Um, we also noticed that um, some alliances, like those focused on arts, for example, Film EU, or those centered around uh, geographical properties like EU Connexus or E3 U Dress, uh, too have weak ties uh, in both programs here. Um, being built upon the existing alliances is not necessarily correlated with multiple pre-existing network ties. Um, we hand searched uh, the different um, web pages which list members uh, of different networks. And we find that UNITE, for example, which originates from the consortium linking universities of science and technology for education and research uh, cluster, um, they have a strong ties in both Horizon and Erasmus. Uh, but uh, CVS2, with most of the original uh, members, uh, were members of UNICA network of universities, but they have average uh, to low network ties. Uh, in both Hor uh, Horizon and Erasmus. Um, we, uh, it, I'm not really meaning for you to, to read this. Uh, we will include this in uh, an annex to our paper. Uh, we find that in many of the uh, alliances, uh, either most or all of the members uh, were um, knew each other from pre-existing networks. Uh, or that the membership was over in two or more networks was overlapping in such a way uh, that every alliance member was linked to at least some others through those pre-existing networks. Um, we also found that a relatively large number of alliances reflected uh, on such previous collaborations on their web pages, highlighting this as a strength and acknowledging that the European Universities Initiative allows them to take uh, those pre-existing uh, collaborations to a new level. Our qualitative analysis um, of the um, alliances on descriptions shows that um, all of the three um, mechanisms, similarities, pre-existing network ties and complementaries have to play some role um, in formation of the alliances, and I've included here some detail, but in the interest of time, I will skip this maybe. Um, I'll just refer to this figure. So we found that the relative prevalence of each mechanism differs. Uh, after combining both the quantitative and qualitative results, we find that um, all three mechanisms appear, uh, appear at the same time in 18 of the alliances. But most of our data indicates that alliances have been largely formed between similar institutions with pre-existing ties. 
uh, or those created through long-standing cooperations through other networks or alliances. Now, our analysis also suggests that in uh, more than half of the cases, uh, search for complementary attributes um, did play a role in how the alliances uh, have been formed. Um, but so far, they uh, relate predominantly to geographical balance, uh, which is a direct result of how the calls have been framed so far. Um, and finally, I move to some of our preliminary at the stage conclusions. Firstly, we found that although the bottom-up approach adopted by the initiative was meant to open up the scheme to all types of institutions, our, the, the, our analysis suggests that so far the alliances comprise predominantly the often resource-rich research-intensive institutions. Uh, however, the requirement for broad geographical coverage and other rules uh, have broadened the scope beyond the top-ranked research institutions. Uh, within the strata, other mechanisms, in particular the pre-existing ties and similarities, play an important role in explaining the composition of alliances. And now we can um, speculate only at this stage about how this might affect uh, the higher education sector in the future. Will the audiences look into the participation of institutions in those alliances when, for example, awarding uh, future funding or choosing a place to study or work? Uh, will awarding the label of European University diminish the role of rankings? Um, and what will be the effect on institutions out of the scheme of the initiative? And some of the questions we are still considering are also those of uh, implications for policy making and the alliances themselves. So um, our instinct is that simply creating more alliances on the same ground might devalue uh, this label um, of European University, um, but also proper uh, diminished, diminished uh, horizontal uh, diversity uh, of institutions. Um, as at the moment, we see predominantly um, PhD awarding uh, research uh, engaged institutions uh, in the scheme. And perhaps what would be needed to keep diversity uh, would be to have different labels for different types of alliances. Um, we don't know, we, we, we're still thinking about it uh, at this stage and we would welcome your uh, feedback. And that was my last slide. Thank you very much for listening. I can't hear you, Benedetto. I think your uh, microphone is flipped up. Uh, mine, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just thinking and I give the word immediately to Thomas. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to be discussant. Uh, for this uh, very interesting paper. And before I start my <laughs> two slides that I have prepared, I would just like to, to mention that uh, I think this is a very useful and very valuable um, contribution that, that Agatha presented today. And I very much encourage uh, studies like this. And therefore my comments are really um, in made in a way that, that aim at uh, improving or suggesting additional thoughts on on the paper that is in the making. So I will now share my two small slides. Okay, I have one slide where I have uh, some clarification issues on the budget side, because I think it's important to know how big this initiative is and what it what it's meant for and what what actually the universities that are engaged in this initiative are doing. So I just did a little calculation and to, to, to better understand how much money is in the system. So we have 41 consortia in this pilot course from 19 and 20 with a total budget of 287. And it's for three years, which means the total budget per year is roughly 96 million euro. 
a consortium can receive up to 7 million euro for three years, and which translates into 2.3 million euro per year per consortium. So, so this is the, the size um, for every consortium. Now we have 280 higher education institutes involved. And if you divide 280 by 41, it gives you roughly seven higher education institutes per consortium, which again translates into 300, I, I rounded up 350,000 euro per year, roughly per, per member in a consortium. And compare that to the 2022 long-term support call, 16 of the 17, as Agatha mentioned, received follow-up support from this initiative and four additional consortia were added, which means we have now 20 consortia in this long-term support funding stream that has a total budget of 272 million for four years which gives you an annual total budget of 68 million euro, roughly. And in comparison to the pilot calls, the money that is given to the consortia and to the higher education institutes is somewhat bigger. So we have 3.4 million euro per year. And I just divided um, 68 divided by 20. And one higher education institute, one university gets roughly 450,000 euro, 470,000 euro per year. So this is, this is the, the range of support that, that the universities get. And then comes my question. Since this is a relatively low level of support, I do not expect, or would not expect universities to engage in setting up new research programs or new research institutes but i wonder for what for what purpose the universities that are funded through this initiative actually use this additional funding so i could imagine of course that they use it for networking for streamlining priorities or something like that but is, is there something more and do you have any insights on what the universities that are engaged in this initiative actually do with the money. So this is one question. And I and my idea would be that in the paper, based on qualitative, on, on interviews, on perhaps also some additional statistics, you, you could actually answer this question and say, what is what is actually going on in these universities with this amount of money? And then I have a couple of other comments and questions. This is just reiterating what Agatha already said. Who participates in this initiative? It's mostly large higher education institutions that are approximately 10 times larger than the non-participating ones. And here I refer to slide 16. We have mostly research-oriented higher education institutions, especially in terms of PhD, intensity and STEM subject fields, and also a strong publication orientation compared again to the non-participating higher education institutes. And oftentimes, these institutes are ranked in the Shanghai ranking, and I will return to that in a minute. Now, regarding the country patterns that Agatha presented, I was wondering whether the conclusion from slide 21 is that we have a linear relationship between the size of the higher education system, the national higher education system, and participation in this initiative. And uh, you had this, this circle around some of the larger countries, but when I look at the entire distribution, it looks as if it is a linear one. But I just want to, to, to ask you if you have checked this or is if it is a, a different distribution um, that I have overlooked. And perhaps you can put that also into your paper as a, as a, as a side note, what, what this um, relationship actually is about. Then, as you mentioned, rankings, the, high, the Shanghai ranking is important. 
But when I read the paper draft and the, the presentation, I was thinking about perhaps it's it's less than expected. Uh, so we have some large countries such Italy and Germany, we are not all of the one to 200 most highly ranked higher education institutes are participating. And so the question is, where are they? What are they doing? Why, why aren't they in there? And also 50% of all consortia that ha have at least 50% institutions which are not ranked. So is this just due to, as you mentioned in your in your presentation, is this just due to the fact that it's required to invite institutes or institutions um, from the periphery, so to speak, and so they should be part of this initiative? Or is there something else going on? Is there perhaps not, not the same interest in all highly ranked institutions to engage in this initiative? And, the question is, why wouldn't they participate? Are there reasons for that? Is perhaps the funding level too small? Or is or are they already engaged in collaboration structures so they are saturated, so to speak? They do not need another initiative. These are just questions that came to my mind when I looked through the presentation. And perhaps what I found most intriguing with your paper is the question of how can we actually trace back that what we see now in this initiative has evolved in the framework programs in the last uh, 30 years. And my understanding from what you presented is that you basically look into the latest version like Horizon 2020 and not in the framework programs that were predecessors like framework seven, six, five, et cetera. And so my question is, I know, of course, that not all the data might be available, but wouldn't it be also an idea to look into the earlier framework programs and to look if if some of those who turn up here as, as consortia have already formed these relationships already in the 90s or in the early 2000s? And this might then also be able to to differentiate between those who have long established and long lasting collaborations and those which are which found together more recently so to speak which are like fresh fresh consortia fresh uh, yeah types of collaboration that have not been mm, tested so to speak so they they are they are too too young to uh, to be uh, called established yeah, this is something um, that came to my mind also. And I would like to finish with a, a, a comment on, on the regional clustering where you presented on slide 20, the country. I think this is very useful. Uh, I do not criticize it. I was just wondering if, if you have all the dots of all the higher institute, higher education institutes, and it's about 350 dots, you might see also a a pattern that is different from like the national comparison. And since georeferencing data is easily available, it might be possible to just to create such a Europe, extended European a map where you can see um, perhaps also if there is some clustering, so to speak. And so um, the country where I come from, from Germany, I could imagine that um, more universities from the southern regions uh, are more active than those in the northern uh, or in the eastern part of the country. And so I could imagine that this is also relevant for countries like Italy or France or Spain and, and, and all the others, Switzerland, et cetera. So this is just a suggestion to, to, to add on a, a more um, disaggregated picture of, of this initiative formation. Thank you so much, Thomas. Agatha, do you want to shortly answer or uh, feedback? Yes, I'll, I'll try uh, at, at least some of it. Thank you. So I understand better what, what you meant by the by the, the map now. Uh, and I think it's a very uh, interesting idea. We looked at the NATS codes before and we haven't seen, you know, most of the institutions are in the urban uh, areas, uh, but I didn't think about it in terms of looking at um, 
regions uh, in in uh, all the countries. So I think it's a great uh, suggestion for something for us uh, to look at. Um, what next? Uh, maybe I'll go back to the issue of budgets. Uh, we haven't looked at it in, in, in detail. I think it's a, also an interesting question from uh, what I understand um, the alliances have uh, complained and uh, that's the 5 million funding in the in the first uh, round of funding was not actually sufficient to cover the costs. Um, in what they mention, what they're using the money for is, um, as, as you said, networking, um, but also uh, infrastructure building, for example, for the um, mobility um, that's not physical because the, the alliances have a goal of um, including um, or allow, um, including uh, or allowing 50% of the students to experience a mobility um, during their studies. Uh, and since it's not possible uh, uh, in terms of actual movement uh, across borders, they are testing different ways of uh, hybrid uh, or fully online uh, mobilities. Um, but they do say that it's not enough. Uh, the European Commission is um, encouraging member states to support um, the institutions taking part in the alliances. And the report from, from CHEPS uh, has a really good overview of which countries do it and in what, in what way or to, um, what amounts and do they uh, afford to the um, participating institutions. Um, but yeah, on how, the, how they spend, I, we, we would probably have to collect some uh, a separate data, but it's a, it's a good question and we'll take, take, it, take it forward. Um, on your, I'm just looking at your second slide. Um, who plays an important role, uh, whether rankings play an important role and perhaps less than expected. Um, I, I agree with you. Uh, um, it's difficult to say why some of the institutions don't participate. Some of the other top ranked uh, institutions in Europe are based uh, in, and currently not in alliances are based in Europe. Um, so for them, there's definitely no um, financial incentive. Um, but the, the, the big limitation of our study is that we obviously look only at alliances which were successful in securing the funding from the European Commission. We do not know who applied, but we know that many more institutions in, in different groupings applied uh, so many more want to be in, but we're not successful so far. Uh, from this newest call that was announced in September, um, the alliances which meet um, the high standards uh, of, um, of the commission will be awarded certificate seals of excellence um, in a similar fashion as, as in other uh, project-based funding. So, um, to suggest that they are worthy, but because of uh, budget constraints, they, they could not uh, receive funding, but should be supported from different sources, for example, through uh, national budgets. I think we, we will perhaps see uh, a bit better because we will be able to see who got the seals of excellence. We'll see more uh, what's the variety of, of other applicants. Um, um, in terms of tracing Consortia back to the framework programs, I have to admit that this part of analysis was completed by, by a colleague, Marco Cavallaro, and I am not 100% sure whether he looked just at Horizon 2020 or did he consider the uh, preceding programs, but I will check this and we will uh, look at both. I think it's very uh, important. Um, question. Um, 
not sure if I answered everything, <laughs> but we'll take forward all your all your comments and thank you very much for for all those that you've sent me already uh, as well. It's, it's really helpful in, in developing uh, our analysis in the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Agatha. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to open the floor for comments and questions. I said, uh, please open your camera if you want. Uh, I see a question or a comment uh, uh, in the chat by Albert. Could you just uh, open your camera and ask directly your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Albert Nijboer um, from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I am a PhD student at the Center for Higher Education Internationalization uh, in um, Milan, Italy. And my PhD, and uh, just starting a PhD uh, on uh, on the European Universities Initiative. Uh, so, uh, I found it a very interesting presentation and uh, and research you uh, you've you've been doing. Uh, I have some questions, and one is that: um, Do you expect or think that uh, the existence of pre-existing ties um, would also influence um, the the change potential of of alliances participating in the initiative. That's one. Um, that's a question for you, Agatha. And I have another question for uh, th Thomas, um, actually, because uh, a very sh a short one. I don't know if we have time, but uh, it's on, on the term of uh, consortium. I was triggered by it because um, um, I'm using a typology of uh, Hans de Witt um, on multilateral partnerships, and he distinguishes specifically uh, networks uh, from uh, consortia. And um, they have different characteristics. Uh, consortia are project-based, short-term focused, uh, very much focused on uh, realization of, of, of a contract, uh, specialized knowledge, uh, and networks have another characteristic. And I see uh, from now that those lines might have a characteristics of both. Um, so what's in a, in a name, but um, yeah, it's just an observation. Thank you. Thank Should you. We should we collect uh, other questions if there are? Uh, I see Matteo Vespa. Matteo? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, mine is not much uh, a question. It's more um, a comment on uh, the importance of uh, of this study and also how how timely it is, um, because um, and it goes also within uh, the series of Rissi's papers on uh, on the on this issue because uh, uh, we now uh, we are in a phase where uh, there is uh, discussion about both the impact uh, of the alliances and also whether it uh, it uh, was successful or not in the in terms of inclusiveness. So. It is actually very, very important. Uh, I was actually be interesting in you knowing when uh, is uh, the study going to be published, uh, um, and uh, also if uh, I mean, I guess that we can use the information from the slides, and if you could also, because we have actually we are actually working on a, say, on a resolution, a policy paper about the financing of the alliances, and also how whether well, there is going to be also part on the. Uh, on the let's say, on how the alliances are impacting uh, can impact the higher education systems, you know. So, uh, so it would be also interesting, you know, in how to quote uh, your research. For what regards uh, some of maybe of the comments also from Thomas on uh, on what we, what are spent what are spent on the money. It's for instance on pilot projects in uh, um, micro credentials or so like online courses. In uh, there are some alliances that are developing the European degrees, but it is like more long term commitment. And uh, maybe an interesting thing of um, of uh, why not all the of another thing that would be interesting to study. Um, and in order also to partially answer to with another question to Thomas question on why not all the top 100, let's say, uh, in the different countries are part of it, uh, would be uh, to understand also the certification within those 100, in the sense that uh, one thing is to be in the, uh, at the 99th place, and the other thing is on the second. And uh, for instance, and my understanding, even if like most of the renowned universities that I know, apart from the UK, are actually part of alliances, is that uh, probably those uh, that are using the alliances are the ones that uh, are uh, in uh, the middle high, but not the uh, the top ones. Uh, for instance, I know that uh, the instrument, the 
the uh, institute in Zurich, and see also Laura in here. Uh, the institute in Zurich decided to enter an alliance, but uh, it is now. But uh, the question is uh, how many of those uh, institutions that are already very well placed in the uh, global higher education market, of like the term, but this is how the rankings do, are actually positioning themselves. So you didn't see, well, even if uh, when it was possible for them to enter, Oxford, for example, Cambridge never, uh, never applied to be in an, in an alliance. So, so probably there is also a, a motivation. And on the other hand, those that are outside of the 1000 probably might not have uh, the um, the uh, the capacity to apply and uh, the call is already a pre-selection in the sense of uh, of the capacity to apply for the call uh, and that is why sorry and that is why it's also important that we stop here what you said about the third call because uh, um, as you as you as you said that the uh, the degree let's say of uh, of inclusiveness uh, in terms of uh, horizontal and but especially vertical and also geographically speaking is uh, being enlarging because uh, those that could uh, that were already the top ones have already applied and this creates also another important element because uh, as far as you know after uh, um, the next call so not this one uh, in that is has been already launched but the one on next year there won't be any no new alliances so after 2024, and uh, this also creates uh, a political question, which is more for us as the stakeholders and from the European Students Union, is whether actually stopping uh, the, uh, the creation of new alliances is actually going to serve uh, the, uh, the issue of inclusiveness of the other project. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see Lorin. Yes, thank you also very much from my side for the very interesting presentation. Um, it's always very good to have some data as well to uh, to underline what we're thinking. And I have um, two questions. One very specific on Switzerland. Um, I saw on the map that you showed, Agata, there was um, three higher education institutions indicated from Switzerland. Um, but this year there were four that joined the alliance, so I wondered why you chose to ex to not take into consideration one of them. Um, maybe if if you could share some um, shed some light on that. And the other thing I was wondering is uh, building a bit on Thomas and also Matteo's uh, comments is um, I'd be quite interested to hear also the other aspects. So not why certain. Um, higher education institutions didn't choose to join, but also why some dropped out. Um, so I wonder whether uh, in, in your data you've already included, because you said you, you used the uh, fact sheets that the commission published. So I think they are still before um, some of them dropped out. I mean, it's very few, uh, so I suppose it doesn't make a big difference in, in terms of the big picture, but uh, be quite curious whether you included that. And, and then of course, the big question, why? Um, but I suppose that would be a different, uh, a different uh, research project, uh, um, more qualitative as well. Um, so yeah, these are my two questions. Oh, and and thirdly, sorry, if you could, um, if anyone could share that link to the study you mentioned in the beginning, the of the performance from uh, the University of Twente in the chat or or in an email, that would be that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Franz, you could share the link. And uh, I see Melinda. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you very much for uh, for your work done on, on this. I, I think it's very relevant in the current discussion on the European universities. Um, I work for ACAR, European Quality Assurance Register for Higher Education, and we have a database of quality assurance results. And we list also um, most of the European universities. And um, my interest is, of course, in whether, um, well, if DACAR data can be used, but maybe for, for next studies, uh, this is just a pitch, uh, just to let you know, uh, we'll be very happy to publish, disseminate every, uh, every information when, whenever you use uh, the DACAR data. Um, and uh, uh, but my my suggestion specifically on the funding questions is um, how much has this been used for joint programs and um, we're most very very interested to know how many joint programs have been carried out and whether how they were accredited um, whether the use of the, um, the European approach for the quality assurance of joint program has been used because we have very little information on this and there is a really keen interest in in policy discussion at European level with with ministries agencies higher education institutions to have an overview view on this 
and we know funding is needed for this, but we have very little information on what's happening on the ground and whether joint programs are put in place or not. So anything uh, that can be followed up on this, um, again, very interested in learning. And if you publish anything on this, also we're happy to disseminate this to all our, to all our stakeholders. So that, that would be my, my two cents. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I see Franz Kaiser, and then we go back to Agatha. Yes, thank you, Benedetto. Uh, thank you, Agatha, for this very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I have one comment uh, or observation, maybe. You used uh, um, um, the rankings as, a, as one uh, indicator there, but it's mainly research dominated. But if you look at the activities of the alliances, that's okay. all teaching uh, and education uh, oriented, or most of it. Uh, to what extent does that then match? To what extent, do, I mean, there are different types of, of, of activities, research activities. I mean, a, a good research university is not, by definition, a good teaching uh, uh, university. So what's, what's that link there? Thank you. I would like to give to Agatha the floor for Thank any you. comments or responses, and then I have a final comments on my side. Thank you. Well, there are so many <laughs> uh, questions. Uh, I, I probably struggle to, to address uh, all of them. Uh, maybe the easiest one first. Uh, Matteo, I believe the presentation is recorded and saved in Zenodo. Um, so it could probably be cited uh, from there. Um, we are obviously planning for the paper to be published as soon as possible, uh, but we all know uh, the process, um, but we're hoping it will be uh, will become a working paper first, so it will be out there fairly soon, uh, hopefully, so um, I'll be happy to, to share the link uh, with the list of participants, maybe as soon as, as the working paper um, is out. Uh, another uh, easy question was from La Lauren uh, about the, the fourth uh, Swiss institution. Um, we really struggled and we talked about it with Movetia, who is checking it actually, because it's not very clear whether University of Basel is treated as a full member because it's um, participating in the Alliance through a pre-existing network that they are part of. Um, so just, just reviewing the kind of sites of the alliance and the, the different member sites, it's not really clear if they will be considered a, a full member for the alliance or is the relationship somehow uh, different. So if this changes, then we will, we will update uh, um, the data set and uh, um, because we, we're not including, there are other alliances that have other higher education institutions as associate members, for example, in uh, North Africa or uh, in Mexico, but they are not, they don't have the same um, rights, let's say, and they don't sit at, at the decision-making table in the alliances. So we need to clarify this in relation to Basel. Um, um, and the other question was about the institutions that dropped out. Uh, indeed, there were very few, uh, and one that we know, uh, Leiden, and that moved, um, and the association. So um, something to, to, to look at. We, we haven't, uh, actually. So it's an interesting suggestion to, to consider. Um, stratification within the top 100, also interesting. Uh, not that many European countries are actually in the top 100, but it's, uh, uh, we, we can compare maybe those top, the, the top 100, uh, look at them in, in a little bit more detail and consider the um, um, participation. Uh, Melinda, we've, um, we've not gathered any data actually on the kind of on the outputs or outcomes uh, so far of the alliances. Uh, I think yes, absolutely is very important. Some alliances do talk about it on their websites uh, as the early results of, of, of their work, but I'm not aware of one place kind of gathering 
all this information together. I would assume it will form part of the evaluations. There are two evaluations going on, one for the European Parliament, one for the European Commission at the moment. Uh, so perhaps it will be uh, included there, but I do, do agree that it's uh, um, an interesting uh, information for, for, for us as researchers uh, as well. It's, it's a bit early to, I mean, those, those evaluations are the first evaluations, um, which are still quite early considering the, the end of the program. I'm not sure if I can maybe take over the question that was directed to Thomas about the consortia and, and Albert, what you mentioned, the um, alliances kind of having features of both a network and a consortium. Um, they are at the moment funded on a project basis of the projects are longer. So this long-term support now is four years with a light touch extension of two years possible at the end of it, um, um, because it's linked to Erasmus funding, obviously. And that's, that's how you can award funding. Um, but the request from the alliances themselves is to create a new funding instrument specific to alliances from 2028. Uh, obviously, it, it remains to be seen if this goes ahead. Uh, but if it does, then that would really change, um, move away from, from project-based for something specific uh, for uh, the allied institutions. Um, maybe I can link here finally to, to Franz, to your question about how it, the rankings relate to education and other areas in ranking don't, and we would, it probably explains this, um, that rankings don't fully explain the participation, because if the purpose of the European Universities Initiative is to support research, but also education and innovation, then institution, then that there is room or other types of institutions, which may not perform as well in rankings to, um, to be included. And we are having conversations about you know, reputation and status and is the, um, are the decisions in the commission made based on reputation? Because obviously um, if we look at the arts-based alliance, for example, the film EU, they may be, uh, don't have a high status when compared to a uh, big research institutions, but their reputation in terms of uh, being a, a, a lead, consisting of leading uh, film related arts institutions, you know, they have high reputation, but it's it's slightly different from from uh, status. I think I will leave it here, maybe, <laughs> uh, but I would really. Uh, Welcome. If you could email me with your with your comments and questions, because uh, they definitely will help us improve uh, the paper, and we'll be happy to to share, as I said, the findings as soon as we we release them officially. Thank you, Agata. I'm taking over shortly before before closing the meeting. A couple of comments. I think the, the first one, I think for our work, uh, uh, it's central is the comment by Thomas, uh, because in a way uh, we all agree, we would expect that uh, the stratification by status plays a role in alliances and you make comment, it might play less of a role than you would expect. And this, uh, I think for us opens uh, a set of questions of why um, we have half of the alliances with mostly non-ranked institutions and how they form and to which extent uh, this is related to the specific policy setting. So the enlargement having many countries uh, and also uh, I, I come back to the comment of France, uh, alliances were designed politically for joint activities, not for research. So of course, status uh, as measured by research performance plays a role, but might play less a role. And indeed we have some alliances like film where the idea is we are highly reputed film schools and we could join uh, in, in, in that respect. So that's a, a first point. Uh, the second one, 
this is this is not and will not become a study on the impact of alliances. Uh, I, I must deceive you. Maybe next study it will become, but there is enough uh, uh, for a good scholarly work to understand the mechanism which led to the formation alliances. However, the two may be related because what Thomas showed, uh, in a way, it's uh, saying uh, uh, financially alliances are peanuts. So through which mechanism my alliances change uh, European higher education or might not change? And of course, one would be, could be becoming a label of excellence in Europe. And uh, what uh, Agatha showed is probably is not the case. You have a label of excellence attributed to a higher education institution which account for half of research capacity in Europe. It's by definition not a label of excellence and not selective enough. Then the question, which kind of mechanism must be symbolic or creating spaces where institutions put their own resources might work. Uh, I don't think our paper can enter into this, uh, but at least we could highlight that uh, how the alliances have co are being constructed will have a deep impact on the type of mechanism. And allows us to exclude that uh, high level of selectivity might work as uh, giving value of being part of alliances simply because there are too many and too many participants and that's too heterogeneous. Uh, so these two comments are probably helpful for us for future research. Uh, if there are no other urgent comments, I would uh, thank Agatha. I think we had a very interesting time uh, in, in discussing this uh, topic and uh, uh, this is opening a new field of inquiry of relevant policy interest. And uh, uh, for closing, I want to um, indicate that uh, the RISI seminar series continues, and it's not only higher education. So the 9th of November, uh, we will have a seminar by Nika Naumannen from Finland on uh, uh, reliability of innovation measures. So the topic will be how innovation measures, particularly those from the Community Innovation Survey, are reliable and can be compared to uh, R&D activity and effort measures with a distinguishing discussant with Carter Block of University Harus, uh, one of the main uh, specialists of community innovation survey. So all with this, uh, I would like to thank everybody for participating and thank especially Agatha and uh, Thomas, and also thank uh, uh, Alessia and Georg for organizing the workshop. And wish you a uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all.